This is an interview with Harry Reid, November 16th, 2007, in Studio X of WILL Building in Urbana, Illinois. The videographer is Harry Radcliffe, Henry Radcliffe, and uh, I am Nancy Rotzel, interviewer. Harry and Henry. All right. Let's get started, and you can tell me where you were when World War II started. I was uh, working in uh, Chicago, mm -hmm. Chicago, Illinois. And, and uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 41, and I was sworn in in February of 42. I uh, picked the Air Force as a branch of service I would like to serve in. And uh, I was sent to Texas for basic training and also to go to Automotive Air Force Mechanic School. From there, I was um, sent to Kansas City to TWA to, for more schooling. After Kansas City, I was assigned to Washington, D.C. to the ATC, which is Air Transport Command. Our outfit was to fly people who run the war. I was uh, placed on Five Star General Arnold's private plane, but he didn't fly very much due to the business of the war, so his plane was used to fly people that was running the war, um, such as um, Harry Hopkins and Stephen Early, who was FDR's private advice, uh, advisors. What was your job on the plane? What? What was your job on the plane? I was a flight engineer. Operate all the controls, except the stick, landing gear, flaps, and everything. Our, re, um, our outfit had the responsibility of flying all the allies and such as uh, the Potsdam Conference, the Quebec Conference, and the Yalta Conference in that order. The big three was FDR, Joseph Stalin, and William uh, Bill Wilson, Will, Winston Churchill. De Gaulle was not included in this, but he was put out about it. So FDR sent Early and Hopkins up to Paris to explain what they went on at the Big Three. FDR was not allowed to fly over the ocean because of he's in a wheelchair and they didn't know how they could handle him out of the wheelchair. At the Yola Conference, he returned to Feb in the United States in February and passed away in April in um, Warm Springs, Georgia. Mrs. Roosevelt flew down to Georgia to bring the body back, but instead of putting it on the plane, they brought it back on the train. Why, I do not know. Vice President Truman took over at that time till the war was over. Um, It was important to fly the Secret Service men ahead of, about 20 minutes ahead of the president to make sure it was, they scattered among the people, make sure it was safe for him to land. So were you flying like the equivalent of Air Force One? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, they didn't call it Air Force One then. Uh, that's something they'll come up with later. You would be surprised what Roosevelt named his airplane the Sacred Cow. <laughs> to, so you actually flew the president, or did you fly the Secret Service, uh, or did you mix it up? Uh, say that again. Did you fly the president, or did you fly the Secret Service men? Secret Service. We fly 20 minutes ahead of the president okay. so they could scatter among the crowd to make sure it was safe for him. Right. Uh, all these flying missions was done in a C-54 called a Skymaster. 
That was the largest plane that the military had at that time until the B-29 come out, the Super Fortress. Um, we set a world's record flying from Washington, D.C. to Stevensville, Newfoundland, nonstop to Paris, to Bermuda, to Azores, to Bermuda, and back to Washington. And we were gone 45 hours, and we were in the air 40 hours and 15 minutes out of the 45 hours. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time up there. Did they fly an escort with those planes? No. One, one time, near the end of the war, they did fly a couple of uh, fighter planes alongside for uh, security when they was in Russia at Yalta. So they weren't afraid for the president being shot down? Yeah, they were. Well, They didn't. They didn't think it was necessary. There wasn't anything at that. They didn't cover that much area at that time that they do now. Yeah, different time. They was out there by themselves, and they, nobody bothered them really. A <clears throat> um, couple of little comments down here. We were photographing the west coast of South America to um, move the supplies and, me and the men to get them to Australia to come up to Japan. But the Truman okayed to fly the, to um, drop the atomic bomb and the, the second one they dropped, they told them both times that they were gonna be, they should get out of the area they drop leaflets, pamphlets, and tell them to get out of the area, but they didn't, people didn't pay attention to it. So they dropped one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki. And after that, that was the end of the war. And um, Japan come to the, the Missouri, boat of the Missouri, uh, with uh, General MacArthur, where they signed an unconditional uh, surrender. That's about all I got to say. Well, well then let's just ask you some questions. What was it? What was the reaction that you remember when FDR died? Everybody was very sorry, very, the, uh, the whole country was uh, down. They, 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 everybody had a lot of respect for his judgment. And when he passed away, it just, unbelievable, dark cloud. And how, well, how did they, what was your reaction to Truman taking over? Well, he was in, in, hardly under her. Nobody today, you know, who the president, vice president, and they're in the news all the time. Nobody even heard of Truman. <laughs> they didn't know he was the vice president. <laughs> but for all of you, you knew you were going to be flying them. Pardon? You were going to be seeing a lot of him if you were going to fly uh, right. in the group that flew That's him. That's correct. So you got to know him? A little bit, a little bit. What's the difference between FDR and Truman as far as just meeting them? I think Truman didn't have the foresight that Roosevelt did. Uh, everybody had a lot of respect and, and thought for Roosevelt and Truman was sort of dumped in there in a hurry and uh, he didn't really know what what was going to be done it was uh, it happened so suddenly what was your reaction at the beginning of the war before you were why were why were you taken in first of all 
Um, you enlisted or you were drafted? I was drafted because I was the right age and the right physical condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the reason. Had you worked on planes before? No. <laughs> I got my training in Texas. <laughs> I didn't know anything about airplanes then. Then how did they decide that you were going to do that? I, I asked for the, to do that. Oh, and did they when test they, it? When they draft me and I asked them, to, I had a choice and I, I asked them to do that. Testing. Yeah. Did, they, did they do some testing? No, I don't think so. They just let you pick? Wow. I did written tests. Oh, I, I hear you did some written tests, however. Do what? Some written tests, trying to figure out what your skills were. Did they make you write out tests? No. No. That's a big job. Yeah. I'll take that back. They did. We did have to write up one test uh, um, in Texas. We had to write a, a Texas take a written test. I forgot about that. That's true. We did to see what what you fit into. But you wanted to do that instead of go go into the South Pacific or go somewhere else? Right. What did you do before the war? I was in uh, um, sales. I was a salesman. Woolworths. Woolworths department store. Oh, so, the, so you didn't have anything to do with planes. You just liked no. them. No, that was all new to me. Much more than it is today. It, 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 that back in those days, there wasn't many, much flying and much uh, airplanes and people flying. Like today, it's common, just common, everybody, you know. Right. Did you all keep track of what was going on in the war? Did I keep track of it? Yeah. As best I could. How did, how did people find out about it? You didn't have television. Uh, <clears throat> true. Radio and newspaper. They were pretty good? Yeah. I wondered if you were in Washington if you got more news than other people. I don't think so. Just it, everybody got the same on the, the, the news and the newspaper and the newspaper and then and the uh, radio was all just like now NBC, ABC, and CBS, and so forth. Big news when the war was over, though. Good news, yeah. Everybody was celebrating. <laughs> was it all worth it? What? Was it all worth it? I think so. Probably. Make a difference in this country? Yeah, I think so. You had lived through the Depression. Yes. How does that compare to after the war? <clears throat> I really can't answer that. I was fortunate. My uh, my dad had a real good job, and we were we never. The Depression didn't uh, affect us. What did you do when you came out of the war? What did I do when I got out? You celebrate? <laughs> no, no. What did I do, Jim? You got married. Was, you got married because... You got married? Was, his wife, now wife, now my mother, followed him to Washington, D.C. Yeah. I was mar We got married in Washington, D.C. And then moved uh, back to the Midwest. He, yeah, he was born in Washington, D.C. A man without a country.
Well, is there anything you want to add? No. No? What about conditions at Work Yalta? Food, uh, how the conference? All right, that's a good one. Where, uh, when, when you were at Yalta, there was the big three. What was it like being there with everyone? You have good quarters? I hate to say this, but it was pretty bad. We were there uh, 13 days, and uh, it was in the winter time, snow, and uh, the food was lousy. It, it was worse than that. It was, I'll tell you how bad it was. We had one meal in the mess hall in Russia, and the rest of the time we were out the airplane. We had we had 13 C-54s on the Yola conference, and one of them was to supply food and water, and we ate on the airplane from there on. Where did the rest of the people eat? All of us, all of us ate on the airplane, and we had to we had to send food back into Roosevelt because it was. <laughs> that's true. That's a funny picture. <laughs> How does that? Was that true of all the other conferences, the Potsdam and the others? Quebec. I had nothing to do with them. Well, I flew up there and back, but I don't know anything that went on there. You didn't stay long. Potsdam was short, and Quebec was only two, three or four days. All it was there. The the site at at Yalta always was interesting to me because we think of it as a wonderful, you know, you think of those kind of things as typically very nice, but if I remember correctly, they were just just almost like a... a so can you describe what it was physically like? Beautiful place to go? Oh, terrible. Terrible. <laughs> it was really bad. They... <clears throat> They had three buildings, and two of them was for the sleep, and one was the, for the food and the business and so forth. And like he said, they had a just a wire up with a sheet slide back and forth between the difference of the people running the war and us. It was just crew members. The food was bad, bad. Crew members for all the other of the, the other two were with you, or were you all separated by? Separated. So you never got a chance to talk to them. No. Did, I believe they moved out the people in the area, the Russian people from the Crimean. Oh, right. So and you only kept a few. Right. So that how did that affect the people who lived in the in the area? I mean, you all come in, and you know the. the you mean powers. Yalta? Yes. They moved everybody out. They told Russia is um, pretty strict, mm -hmm. and they're going to have the conference there. They told everybody to move out, and we'll tell you when they can move back in. <laughs> That's you think hard that, to. You think that would have gone in the United States? Huh? You think they would have been able to do that no. in the United States? <laughs> no. There's all the difference at that time, and probably still a little bit now, but more so then. The difference between Russia and the United States was like black and white, that far apart. Do you think because you flew the planes and met so many, what did you call the, the groups that you flew? Allies. No, the allies and the, what was the other category? Big, or the big three? No, the big wigs. Isn't that what you said? Uh, it's just allies. Okay. But when, but when you when you flew them all, and do you think you knew more about what was going on than most people because you heard things? Yes. Did you ever talk about it? No. What would have happened if you had? I don't think anything. Did anybody warn you not to? No. No, no 
Nobody wanted to call a newspaper and tell them something extra. No. That's pretty, that, that's interesting. When they did the, the, when they did the flights along the west coast of South America, though, the uh, dignitaries from. You want to talk a little bit about your trip to South America? What you were doing and what people thought you were doing? <coughs> well, we um, we flew to Panama, and then gassed up there, and flew to Quito, Ecuador. That's the capital of Ecuador. Is Quito on the the um, Ecuador is a, the equator goes right through the city, and you had to fly in and t before ten o'clock in the morning, and. F because it, the clouds come down on the city, and they couldn't get in and out only at, up till ten o'clock in the morning. Um, they um, they were taking, I think I told them though, didn't I, about taking pictures of the west coast of South America? Right. Why were you taking them though? Um, they were going to. It took too long to ship men and material by boat. They wanted to get it down there and get to Australia and come up to Japan and uh, could speed it up that way. So they they knew what cities they could take it there because it was slow getting across the uh, ocean with boats. And uh, it would be faster this way to use men and troops and supplies across the ocean to Australia to come up against Japan. But the atomic bomb stopped that. They didn't have to do it. Would they, would they have flown troops? Yeah, yeah. But the people didn't know that's what they were doing. Yeah, so, th so that was all a secret, though. Sort of. Because they had... Yeah dignitaries from South America yeah. that Who? thought they were looking at a, been seeing the plane. It was either in the belly or in the tail. They right. were doing the photographing. Well, it, how, when, you, when you did that, it was a planned, it was a possible planned invasion, right? Yes. Who was in charge of that? Do you know? Um... Probably, I don't know whether Eisenhower would be in charge of that. Um, probably Douglas MacArthur, I think, would have been in charge. Would have been in charge of that. He was in the uh, Pacific uh, area. That was where he was in charge of. Right. Did they make modifications to your plane to be able to take the pictures and everything? No. Just took a window out, and they had a camera that was about that big, and take the pictures out of the out of the side of the airplane, and then put the window back in. Still pictures. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Somebody had a lot of film in the back of your plane. Yeah. <laughs> How long did that take? Um, I'd say it took about three days to do it. Now, they weren't taking pictures all that time, but from town to town and where they stayed and then go up and take the pictures and then to the next town. See, they went to Afghanistan, Lima, Peru, San, San, uh, San Diego, uh, Chile. And that took about three days, I'd say. Did all your crew remain the same for those four years? Yeah. Nobody, no, you had no injuries? No, none. You were lucky. Very, very lucky. Only one shot came through. Had about uh, 2,500 hours up there, yeah. the total, in the four years that I was in the service. 
And you were never shot at? No. One bullet came through the plane in over Italy, I think. I can't hear you, Jim. No, he was saying that something happened in Italy. Did you get shot at it in Italy? Oh, um, the island of Malta out in the Mediterranean was the um, rendezvous for the Yalta Conference. Mm -hmm. And um, one plane took off and the, he, we kept radio silence. So nobody the, couldn't, the enemy couldn't keep track of what was going on. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, they took off from um, Malta to go up to Russia and um, one airplane, the first airplane got three shots put through the, the aileron and the rudder, but they was able to dig and get out of it and that was it. So they changed the way of going and instead of going up that way from Malta, they went over to Athens, Greece and up that way and I got to see all that Athens we flew around it twice around just to see all that uh, destruction, you know, over the years. You've seen all those pictures uh, of Russia or um, you know, uh, Greece, Athens, Greece, and then on up to there. Ever figure out who shot at them? A friend of mine was in the, in that airplane. I wasn't in the one that got shot, named Coleman, and he was sitting in the seat back in the back. He got up and was walking up to the flight deck, and one of the shots went right through the seat where he was sitting. <laughs> that's that's shaky. Yeah, Betty couldn't wait to tell you. Yeah, right. Did they have? They didn't have to put down in order to repair or anything. No. Was that was when you were on your way to Yalta? Right. So he was one of the. Did you say three planes? How many planes? Thirteen. Thirteen. Twelve passengers, and one supply. The um, they only put one or two exec the allies in a plane. Because if one went down, they didn't want to lose everybody. Yeah. Never, they never lost any, but they were playing it safe. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you feel a lot of stress? Pardon? Did you feel a lot of stress when you no. were in the plane? Yeah. Why not? Just got used to it, and it's just routine. From the very beginning? No. After I was in there a little while, you just get... You just get used to it and then think nothing of it. And all the stories about all the the hot spots around the world where people were being shot, they didn't you didn't think you might be next? <laughs> no. Brave man. Well, because of the dignitaries, they stayed away from almost anything that involved crime. Uh, right. But today but today you would have people shooting at the kind of people you were Ferrying no, around. That's right. What do you think makes the difference in the time? Why didn't anybody go after them? I don't know. Would have surprised you? Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, I, I think we're... Do you want to kind of sum up? Give me a brief couple sentences on your experience and what you thought of World War II. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. How about your part in it? How about your part in it? Was it an important thing to do? What? Was your job important? Well, I think so. Because why? That was, they had so many people had to do this, and, and it is just part of it.
But what did you, you're doing it, what did it accomplish for the war? I don't think you accomplish much in war. People get killed and maimed and and when it's all over, there's always something going on over there. Uh, people getting killed and every day in the newspaper, airplane or uh, automobiles blow up, kill people. They never, I don't understand why they don't settle down and have peace. But what you did contributed to the contributed to the war being solved, didn't it? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Because because of the people you took or what? What was your contribution? Just just flying the people. Getting them where they needed to go. Yes. Correct. <clears throat> Excuse me. Correct. He always felt very fortunate because he was not yeah. near. Yeah. He got to see the world, but wasn't yeah. near. You got to see a lot. Oh yes. And the war was around you. Is that about? Is that a good picture? I don't know. I mean, you got to see. You got a lot of places. Well, I got to see a lot. That's true. Were you lucky? Very, very lucky. Why? <laughs> Never had any trouble. I never got in. No, never got in any trouble at all. By that I mean, wherever we were, nothing happened there that you could get killed or something like that. Just we were never at the. I guess we were at the right place at the right time, and uh, never, just never got. Anywhere where he's going to get in trouble. Proud of what you did? Proud. Of what you did? Proud. Very. I, I, um, I feel lucky, but also it was had to be a job to be done, and I, I, I en enjoyed doing it, and uh, I feel very lucky that everything worked out that way. I think it's a good place to end. It's a great ending. Good ending? Yes, that you feel good about it. Yeah, I do. True. Good. He, was, he ran away at age 16 and, and joined World War I. He was gassed in France and he died on his 18th birthday. And she had these wonderful letters from him that when I was little I remember I, I found I guess it was when I was a teenager, I found and I read, and they were so wonderful. And when we moved her here from Pennsylvania, it never occurred to ask to me, um, for me to ask her if she saved them. And when she died, I went through all of her things, and they were gone. So I feel really bad that you dumped things, because I know how bad I felt.